Hello and welcome to Castle Talk, where we talk to writers and creators of today's genre worlds. I'm your host, Jason Henderson, author of the new book, Quest for the Nautilus, Young Captain Nemo from Macmillan Children's Books. This episode, we're talking to James Rollins, author of the new book, The Last Odyssey, due out from William Morrow, HarperCollins, on March 24th. James, welcome. Thanks, Jason. I appreciate it. I'm, this is really interesting to me because this is the 15th book in uh, a series called Sigma Force. Correct. And I've heard them described as... Uh, scientists with guns, uh, exactly. you know, or Delta Delta Force with PhDs. Can you explain to me what is Sigma Force? What do people sure. come to expect in that series? Well, Sigma Force, they're a, a group of former Special Forces soldiers that get drummed out of the service for various reasons. But because of special <laughs> aptitudes or skills or talents, they were secretly recruited by DARPA, the Defense Department's Research and Development Agency, to mm-hmm. and, and retrain a various scientific discipline to be field agents for them. So that they basically go out there protecting against various uh, global threats, mostly of a scientific basis. So, and you you actually research, uh, I mean, the way, I, the way I've come to understand this, it's very similar to like, uh, you know, it's like a multi-person dirt pit, basically. You, you research something right. super heavily, or Michener, Michener uh, with weapons, uh, you research something super heavily and then turn it into a, a, a kind of... Uh, I don't even know what a techno thriller of sorts is. Um, well, first of all, is that what you call these books? Are they techno thrillers? What, what do you call? I them? call them. I call them scientific thrillers. Even though ah. there's a strong sort of historical element to uh, each of the books, uh, they're mostly looking at some type of some type of technological or scientific threat and extrapolating, you know, what that might look like if if everything goes awry. And in the last Odyssey, they've discovered a, a ship uh, half a mile under the ice, and it. it it ticks off this uh, this new adventure. So, what's the what's the scientific threat this time? You know, for the longest period of time, uh, you know, everybody sort of dismisses uh, the ability of ancients to to be technologically advanced. You know, there's uh, and I've watched those ancient astronaut episodes. You know, where they yeah. try to say, you know, there's no way the Greeks could have done this or the Egyptians could have done this. So, you know, so it must have been ancient astronauts. And <laughs> so it's a surprise, you know, how we underestimate you know, the technology of these, of these ancient peoples. You know, I spent a little bit of time over in, in Greece. I went to the National Archaeological Museum in Athens, and I saw the, the Antikythera mechanism. It's a, this, this uh, artifact that was discovered in a shipwreck. And mm. look at it, it looks like something out of a, out of a computer bank. And uh-huh. at this point, most archaeologists now accept that the device is probably is the first known sort of analog computer. And I did further research to find out that, you know, Greeks were really sophisticated in what they were you know, pulling off. They they were inventing all these self operating mechanisms, these these, uh, these cunning automatons, these ingenious mechanical devices. And so this book sort of shines a light on 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 how you know you ever heard of the the term Greek fire? You know the the ability mm-hmm. to you know this fire that can't be put out. That if you try to put out with the water, it gets worse. The recipe was lost. You know in time. Even today, where there's still some debate exactly how you make Greek fire. So this book looks a lot about the the, the science, the ancient science of the Greeks and how advanced they were. So the threat is that we do discover right at the beginning of the novel this uh, centuries old medieval ship that's buried half a mile underneath the uh, ice of, of Greenland. It holds a collection of, of artifacts that date back to the Bronze Age, including this clockwork gold map that's crafted by a group of Muslim inventors. And it's the map that's rumored to lead to Tartarus, the Greek version of hell that's featured in the mm-hmm. Homer- late in the odyssey and uh, once word spreads uh, zealots got an idea of using this knowledge to uh to basically break it up the gates of hell and, and unleash an apocalypse and sigma force to stop them must go where you know all humans fear to tread is to cross through those very gates of hell to save the world and this isn't uh so 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 here's something i don't know this isn't a literal you uh, these books are, are technologically based right so we're not dealing in the supernatural elements not at everything's all. always it's going to have on science i have a sort of a what's true what's not section at the end of all my novels interesting I curtain i say you know where you know how much of this is because some of the stuff that, that uh, you're going to read in this novel is going to be quite shocking you're going to think i'm making it up but uh, you know i will lead you to the sources in which i'm i'm drawing from on sort of uh you know, draw the line between fact and fiction uh so isn't there a, a shield that, you know, I, really I interrupted you i'm sorry that, if there's any topics that are raised in the book that maybe are of interest to a reader, you know, then I'm going to leave some breadcrumbs at the end that they can follow. So, you know, yes, I, I ground this in reality. I, I look at the science today and I am going to extrapolate where they might head to. And I've done that for the Greeks. They did these, uh, these amazing things. And I, you know, I extrapolate, well, what, was that, what might that look like? And mm-hmm. that went a little bit further than what most people think they were able to achieve. Do you hear from, from readers from time to time going, 
hey, I, I've I've read about this. I want to know more about the truth, or or all, I brought it up. Yeah, all the time. Matter of fact, I started doing the what's true, what's not section because I was I was fielding so many you know, email questions or on, on Facebook or on social media about you know is this true? Where do you get that? And so rather than having to answer the same email you know 101 times, I decided I'm just going to put it in the back of the book. And most people enjoy. Um, I think they enjoy that part of the book more than the book itself because it's a, it's quite a it's quite illuminating to find out exactly how much you've been reading that you thought was fiction was actually fact. Absolutely. Yeah, I remember my dad and I used to anytime we'd watch something like The Wild Geese or whatever, you go like, you know, what if this is true and what's not, and who here actually existed, and and and, and so forth. Um, when you, one thing I really like about about this series is that they are individual books. You know, you, you have you have recurring characters, but you could pick up pick up and put down any given one of them. Is that in this day of like uh, of continuing stories and and serialized stuff, was that deliberate? Is that what you always wanted to do? Um, actually, I, I resisted doing a series for the longest period of time. Um, my my first uh, dozen books are all standalone adventures. Now it's getting a lot of pressure from my house. You know, do a series, do a series, and I was like, I don't really want to do. A series because I had some some qualms about doing a series and and I, it's what I call a Jessica Fletcher the Jessica Fletcher syndrome from Murder She Wrote um, yeah here's yeah. woman from Cabot Cove that's always falling over dead bodies stumbling over dead bodies I've never you know tripped over a dead body so what is her problem you know, <laughs> you know her suspension of disbelief gets strained and also it's hard to maintain jeopardy in the series because if someone pulls a gun on Jessica puts it against her head, you know that trigger's never going to be pulled because she's yeah. going to be in next week's episode. So it's hard to maintain Jeopardy. So I didn't really want to do it. And then I invented the, the, the Sigma group for what I thought was a standalone novel, Sandstorm. But I liked that group so much, I was sort of disappointed to end that novel. And I realized, wait a second, you know, what if I based my series on a group of characters rather than an individual? So the threat can come from many different directions, but at the same time, nobody's safe. You know, I can knock off a major character because Sydney right. can always recruit somebody new to take their place. So and I also like the ability to, you know, to shuffle, you know, to turn the spotlight onto different characters in, in the group. You know, one book will be maybe, you know, concentrating on Monk, one of the characters. Another one will be concentrating on Kowalski. So it's nice being able to, to shift that spotlight around too. So by, by you know, getting around that, uh, I realized I'll, I'll do a series, but I didn't want to make a series where you had to read every book in order. You know, I've read series where, I've tried to pick it up in the middle. I'm like, I'm lost. I don't know what, and I I don't really want to feel obligated. I have to read the other eight books in that series to understand the one I just bought. So Mm -hmm. I structured this particularly, uh, specifically rather, so that, you know, what I, I I, to be honest with you, I don't think very many people have read my series in order except for me. Um, (laughs) I put in whatever backstory you need to know. I'm going to put into this novel. Uh, Any details you need to know, you're going to, you're going to, I'll I'll put in the novel so you're not going to feel lost. And then, uh, uh, you know, if you like the book, hopefully you go back and, and, and pick up the other other books down the line. It reminds me of, uh, you know, Reacher. No, no two of those books go together. So he even, he'll put, he'll write a new one and it's like, it takes place like three books earlier. Than, yeah, the timeline and he, is all, and he just jumps around in time with. with he just doesn't care. Right. It just, <laughs> it, it, it just simply, it doesn't really matter to the one, to the one that you're picking out. He knows in theory, where they all lay out together. But um, I wonder, you I said in one of... A big map out there where it's got everything laid out. you got to hope that, that there is a whiteboard with, with all of them. Yeah, yeah. Crack um, the child's uh, place and try to find that. <laughs> I actually interviewed the biographer of that guy who like hung out with Lee Child and wrote down things he said, which is the funniest thing to imagine, right? He followed Lee Child around and wrote down the things he did and watched how he worked and then wrote a whole <laughs> other book about Lee Child working, which is kind of fascinating because and, and I... Lee, Lee's a great guy. I mean, uh, you know, he, I was a co-president with the International Thriller Writers for, for a, a year and uh, he was running the, the, uh, the new author program. And ah. so he, you know, he really took a lot of authors under his wing, gave them blurbs, helped them out. Uh, he really was so generous with his time to, to pull authors out of obscurity and give them that leg up. That's I mean, that's truly fantastic. The um, I was curious. You said in a, in one of the places I was reading about your biography that you came up reading things like uh, Kenneth Robeson novels, you know, oh, classic. Right. Avenger and, and stuff like that. And it seems to me this is like that, except for that you got a team, which I guess oh. is like Doc Savage. Yeah, I mean, um, yeah, I've got 100, you know, if I, right now in the room I'm speaking to you with, I have 181 Doc Savage novels sitting right to my right. Uh, and, you know, again, it's a, it's a series based on a team. And they're a team yeah. that are, you know, have a, a various abilities that allow Doc and company to face various threats. And one of the members of Doc's team is, is, a, is a character named Monk. And so I went ahead and... yes borrowed that character for my series what do you think is the 
I, I'm curious, what do you think is different about your job from the guys who were writing under the name Kenneth Robeson? I mean, how have things changed since the day when you could go and buy a Doc Savage novel for for 15 cents or I'm, I'm still shocked that they, they were, they were producing these, these pulp novels, you know, one a month. And I'm mm. shocked that they were able to a be of the quality they were. And as, as a manager that they were to call that many different plots, people have always asked me, gosh, you know, Jim, you know, you've written, you know, 34 novels, you know, you're, you're how your mind must work that you're coming up with so many ideas. And I'm, I'm thinking, well, these guys, you know, in a matter of, of one year have to come up with 12 ideas. I've just right. two. So <laughs> pretty darn impressed. Yeah, I mean, I was looking at, at I, I'm fascinated by gothic novels from that whole big mid-century period. And uh, Dan Ross was writing gothic novels. He was writing the Dark Shadows novels and stuff. And he was turning one out like every five or six weeks. And that's just always, a, you'd have to almost be going almost subconsciously. You just start a new one and you roll. You kind of know sort of where the plot's going. Um, you know, and, and I'm glad I'm living today. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds like a lot of work. Yes. Well, and you do different kinds of work. That, that's that's what strikes me is that you come from that tradition, at least that was something that you were into as a kid. But what you're writing are these extremely meticulously detailed and researched, and I want to get it right, and I want to let people know when I've deviated from from what I researched. It's a it's a different world where you're working working harder is not the right, but it's a different kind of work than what they then. I suppose so. I'm still impressed. Guys. With, oh uh, yeah no i'm listen i'm not denigrating at all what the what the mid-century pulp novels novelists did because i think it's i think it's fantastic work but but it's it's funny to, i also feel like you are uh overcoming much greater challenges because remember in the day of doc savage uh what did a man do after after dinner but read a paperback novel that's, that's true. and and those days are gone you know <laughs> <laughs> now, we have a lot of distractions in life of late. Yeah, yeah. Although I think lately, during this time of cholera, it might be actually a time when people turn back to books. I hope so. I mean, I always enjoyed, you know, back in the olden days when you were right around an airplane, mm -hmm. we had no choice but to read a book because there was no yeah. other entertainment out. There was no, you know, flat screen in the seat back up in front of you. There was no, you know, uh, onboard Wi-Fi. So you were pretty much... You know, you get the luxury of, of going, I don't have anything else to do. There's no guilt involved. I, there's nothing except I can sit here and read. I miss those days. Me too. And, you know, I was just wondering, what do you think brings people? So even before our stay inside period, right? Uh, books have been doing really well the last couple of years, especially with like, uh, you know, readers who are reading um, in Kindle Unlimited and, sure. and reading romances by, you know, hundreds and hundreds. What brings people back to books? You speaking as an author, but also as a fan, what, what's keeping them there? I think ultimately, you know, we are as human beings, innate devourers of storytelling. You know, we, we love mm. to tell stories, we like to hear stories. And, you know, now with the new media out there, there's so many ways to consume the, that storytelling. And, you know, there's the old adage, you know, the, the, you know, that movie was never as good as the book. The book was better than the movie. Is mm -hmm. that there's so much story you know, buried within the, 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 the covers of a novel than you're ever going to find in a two-hour movie. So you get a lot of bang for your buck. You know, what yeah. I love as a writer is I have an unlimited FX budget. You know, I yeah. can... I can build the craziest, you know, you know, action scene setups and I can, I don't have to worry about, you know, can I, can we afford that? And, and, you know, that's something that that's unique to, to, to books. Yeah. Yeah. That's wonderful. Um, finally, I, I, I do want to, well, I want to ask you one more thing about the book and then I'll ask you about, sure. about your process. So you, one of the things that you posit in this, um, uh, in this book is something called World War Zero, which I guess was a, a, a great disruptor to um, to the Mediterranean world. What's World War Zero? And is it real? It is, it's real, definitely. Um, there was a period of time called the Greek Dark Ages. Um, and it was a period of time where, during the Bronze Age, that very little is known about. It's about 300 years that is a blank spot in history. And why it's a blank spot is at that, you know, prior to that Dark Ages, there were three civilizations that were flourishing. There was the, the Mycenaean Greeks, the uh, the Hittites, and the Egyptians. They had huge, gigantic kingdoms, thriving mm -hmm. very well, a lot of trade going on amongst them. Then all of a sudden, 
uh, another force arrived into the Mediterranean and laid those three civilizations to brought them to their knees, you know, laid them laid them down and brought them into a dark age. Uh, so that's why we know so little about them is that these civilizations with their ability to write and record and uh, is gone. So it's just basically they're wiped out. Now it was so extensive, the fighting was so extensive that it was dubbed by a lot of historians to be World War Zero, the first sort of uh, true world war because it was a war that was across the then known world, which was basically most of the Mediterranean. Mm. And what does not known and it's something you're going to discover in this novel is who was that that laid them low uh, even today historians don't really know they don't know what what other opposing force came in there knocked down these three civilizations and then vanished so they, and i've talked to a bunch of historians and archaeologists about the different theories and and what's in the book is, is based on that research there is there is an answer to that um and you're going to discover in the novel what what was that opposing force? Who was this unknown em- enemy that brought you know three massive civilizations to their knees? I I, I know you do what like what uh, about one of these a year? Is that right? I do one sigma book a year and then something else. I generally do two books a year, and I, I use my other part of the year to, to just to stretch my my literary legs a little bit and do something different. I've done a, I've done a middle school series. I've done some collaborative work in the horror genre. Uh, mm-hmm. I've done I've, I've, this next year. I'm going to be doing the, the first in the fantasy series as my as oh cool. Other novel of the year. How much do you uh, do you try to? I mean, I, a lot of people have goals like their their weekly output or whatever. I have a weekly goal of seven thousand or a daily goal of five hundred. Like, what is your what is your goal? And when I was working full time as a veterinarian, uh, I had to find cracks in time to write. And, and I think any author needs to find that a combination of how to fit writing in with their daily life. And I realized, okay, I'm going to do three pages a day. Mm. No, I'm going to do three double space pages a day. So basically about page and a half. And I'm not going to do it every day. I'm going to do five out of seven days out of the week. But huh. Once I go up to and I realize that actually fits in my life. I can I can do that without feeling like I'm stressed out or I'm, or I'm overexerting myself. I can still, you know, be that veterinarian, but still get these pages produced. But I thought if I ever yeah. were a day job, I'd be much more productive. Uh, if I didn't have to work the, the 14 hours as a veterinarian that day, I'll be much more productive with my writing. And I am. I do five double space pages a day. So I find that's about all I can do. I, I, I hit a wall. I take about an hour to write one page. So five pages, about five hours of new writing. The rest of the day, is is either doing some research, calling people up, and getting some details sure. you need to get nailed down, or the business side of writing. You know, uh, uh, massaging social media, uh, dealing with uh, the nuts and bolts of uh, uh, a writerly career. No, understood. So that's your vertical limit is five double space pages, which is like yeah, I, do, I, do I imagine five, about a thousand two. thousand words. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. That's it's funny you mentioned the social media aspect, and and I was thinking, you know, uh, when a lot of people I know started writing. The publisher would actually say, listen, your job, don't bug us about marketing. Your job is to write the books, leave it to us. We'll take care of that. You know, maybe we'll send you on a signing or whatever. But and now that's not the case at all. You're expected to come in and do some tweeting. And if you can make a book trailer, make a book trailer. If you can like reach out. Yeah, lean on us a lot for 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 doing our own uh promotions and publicity. When I first started, I was, I was, you know, this, uh, my first book was published in 98. So mm-hmm. very, few, very few authors even had websites. I was like cutting edge because I had a website. Yeah. Um, and I heard about this thing called Facebook and, and, and I thought, this is a great way of communicating to, to readers. Like, you know, I, we should take advantage of it. I talked to my publishers, Hey, this, you know, Facebook thing is really cool. You know, you know, maybe you, you might help me, you know, figure out how to use this better. And they go, oh, Facebook, you know, what a waste yeah. of time. Get to writing. Right. So, but now, you know, now they train <laughs> writers on how to use Facebook and how to use social media and how to Instagram and Periscope and every other, you know, aspect of social media out there. Yeah, it is. It's, it's utterly different. And it's strange. It's a, it's a strange challenge for the writer because it means that those are skills, right? You said if the best of them, they'll, they'll provide you a little bit of training, but I mean, those are not skills that you just come out of an MFA program being able to do uh, is, is, you know, tweet. Um, I mean, writing is supposed to be a solitary profession. I'm supposed to go to my cave and, ne- and you never see me. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Case. Yeah, it's different now. Wow. Well, that's that's really exciting. Okay, the new the new book is the Last Odyssey. It actually premieres tomorrow. Which, if you're listening sometime this week, it it premieres March 24th. So by the time you're listening to this, it is available and it's out from William Morrow and Harper Collins, James Rowland. Thank you for talking to us about the 15th book in the Sigma Force series. And I hope you have a fantastic launch week. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. I appreciate it, Jason. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. Yes, sir. Oh, thank you. Bye.